right, praise the Lord, everybody. We uh, we're gonna go ahead and start here just a second early. I'm gonna see if I can go ahead and get this uh, set up here so that we have other people who need to get on and share it real quickly. So if you would give me just a second. So we'll give it a minute or so for everybody to tune in. Yeah, this is that's what we have to do because of weather. And uh, I love the snow, but uh, it is rough. I miss seeing all of the beautiful faces of my church family. I love you all. Wish I could be with you in person, but uh, because we can't, but because of weather, we're going to go ahead and. Still have church. We're not going to do any music. The piano I have at home is severely out of tune. Um, but uh, you guys can crank up some church music. Thankfully, Pastor has provided you some of your praise break boxes. You guys can play some music at home and just worship and praise God. So we're just going to have the preaching of the word and uh, then move on tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to come back on here and uh, do this again. But as for right now, we are uh, going to just get into it here in just a moment. Um, I want to say one more time that uh, I love and miss all my church family. And uh, I wish that uh, we'd be able to be in church. Like I said, I love the snow. But this is a big bummer is uh, not being able to be together. All right. So uh, with that said to get into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, if you don't, go ahead and grab them. I'll give you a minute to do so. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 14, verse number 25 is where we're going to start. Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 25. We are, uh, our topic that we're going to go over today is worry. And uh, specifically how that worry is an enemy of faith. Um, so one of the things about worry is it's something that everybody's going to deal with at one point in their life. They're going to deal with it, uh, when you have children as a parent, you're going to worry about your kids. Um, and as an owner of things, there's going to be times that you worry about things that you possess. You got that new car and, uh, it looks so nice and... You're going to worry about it getting scratched up and beat up. and There's things of that nature. But in our society today, in the fast-paced world that we live in, a very hectic and chaotic society that we have in the United States, we deal with worry even more so. And so um, one of the things about worry is that it is to God... A, an expression of a lack of faith. And so we're going to deal with that. We're going to talk about it and why that it is a problem and how we should deal with it and, and so on and so forth. 
Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 25 says this. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked upon the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So the thing about worry is that worry fixates upon the problem. It, it puts all of the attention, it puts all of the emphasis, it puts all of the focus upon the problem that you're having. It puts the emphasis upon your storm. It puts the emphasis upon what you're going through. And, and all of a sudden, all of the attention goes to the problem. And so, when it, we see Peter here, when he steps out of this boat, he sees Jesus walking on the water, first of all. Jesus comes walking to him on the water. And when he sees him, he says, if it be you, bid me to come. Because when he saw Jesus do it, he said, if Jesus can do it, I'm a follower of Jesus, then I can do it. I, I can do it if he can do it. And said, bid, to me, bid me to come to you. And so Jesus said, come. So Peter steps out of the water, and he's looking at Jesus, and he sees the epitome of what he wants to become. He sees the, he sees the uh, expression, the actual expression of, of the faith that he is, he is acting upon. He sees the, uh, the example of an actual practice. And so as he steps out of this water, and he's looking at Jesus, and he's walking towards him on the water, the Bible says that, that when he saw the boisterousness of the wind, in other words, whenever he began to, it starts out with a feeling. Whenever you're going through a battle, whenever you're facing something, you can begin to feel it in your atmosphere. When you have that spiritual sensitivity, you can begin to feel it in the atmosphere that when you're in, when you're in battle, it, it's, it's that shaking, it's, it's that moving, it's, it's what you're going through. It's the, it's the battle that you're facing, and, and you can feel that atmosphere of battle. It's the buffeting of the wind as it pushes you to and fro. But, but you're on the water and, and you've stepped out by faith. You see that especially in times of revival, especially in times when God is moving upon you and, and you see that and prayers being answered and, and God is moving you to do things for the kingdom of God, especially in those moments. Those are the moments when you step out by faith. Those are the moments when you when you lose your points of reference, uh, when you don't have your, your comfort zone, when you don't when you're not in a place that has the, the foundation you can just run back to real quick. Uh, but you've stepped out of the boat and now you're in, in limbo. You're in a place where it's that leap of faith in essence. Uh, when you're in that place, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in a place that my own strength is useless. And and so you stepped out into that faith, and when you begin to feel that buffeting, you, you don't feel like you have anything you can grab onto. That's faith. That's stepping out of faith. That's where you are. This is where Peter was. And so when he is looking at Jesus, everything is all right because the essence of what he believes in is there before him. And he's walking towards it. And, and, and then when he begins to feel the buffeting of the wind and, and the waves, and, and then he begins to look, what is this I'm feeling? And then he sees the waves. Excuse me. He sees the, the large walls of water as the wind kicks up the water and, and the water is, is huge. And he, when he sees this, when he sees the magnitude of what he's going through, when he sees the problems that arise because of the storm that he's in, he begins to fixate upon them. And he begins to see that wave and say, oh my goodness, that wave is a problem. And so we'll come back a little bit later when it talks about it. And, uh, and we'll deal with it in a bit more detail on the aspect when he saw it, he was afraid and he sank. We'll deal with that aspect again in a moment. But the thing is, is that he fixated upon the problem. His eyes went from Jesus to the problem. From Jesus to the storm that he was in. To Jesus to the, to the issues of the storm. The, the, what the storm caused. And so, we can find ourselves in the same situation. In fact, we do. A lot of times, we 
began to go through a storm and then all of a sudden things began to happen. My family has gone through a lot. My family in the last couple of months have been in probably six car accidents or had our vehicle run into six times. Nobody hurt, but the vehicle has suffered in every occasion. And I recognize that this is, this is the result of the storm that we're going through. When you're in spiritual warfare, when you're in battles, when, when you're going through things, that, 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 that when, when the enemies come against you, God's blessing us. We're seeing the power of God moving. We're seeing God preparing things and moving things. And, and we can feel it in the atmosphere as, as God is preparing great things. And, and in all of this, we see this, but there are problems. That the, the storm produces problems. The storm produces irritants and, 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 the, and, and it produces things that, that are irritating and that, that, that get in the way and that, that they're just annoying little things that, that come up and sometimes they don't seem little at the moment. And so this is what the storm produces. With all, with all of that, with the, the vehicles, God's blessed us. And we've come out better than we were before. But the thing is that the enemy wants us to fixate upon the problems. That's what worry is. It's fixating upon problems, whether future or present. It's fixating upon those things. Even sometimes past problems that are chasing you, it gets you to fixate upon them and to look at them and, and try to deal with these on your own power. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's all right. The thing is, is that even in prayer, this happens. You got to be careful because we are supposed we are supposed to pray about things. But when you begin to fixate on something in prayer, and you keep going back over it over and over again, oh God, this this car problem I've got. Oh God, you know. And then tomorrow comes. Oh God, this problem is just so big. God, take care of it. What's going to happen? Or maybe it's the electric bill. Oh God, I, I've got to pay this electric bill, God. And, and, and I don't have the money. I don't know where the money's going to come from, God. And, 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 and you're over there just, oh, God, please take care of my electric bill, Lord. I, we, we don't know what we're going to do. Where's the money going to come from? Do I have to get extra work? And does this sound familiar? You can read about I feel the Holy Ghost. This is what worry does. The thing about worry is that worry is an enemy. It destroys your faith. Because... It doesn't matter how many times God has blessed you. It doesn't matter how many times God's paid your electric bill. You come to your electric bill and you don't have the money with you at the present. And worry will come right back. It doesn't matter how. It could, God could have paid your electric bill six times already. Miracles that God produced the money. But it comes back and here you are again. And you don't know where the money's going to come from. And you're back into worrying. And hope, oh God, where is it going to come from? And, and you're fretting. And God's proved himself faithful to you already. Because worry destroys faith. Amen. And it's something that as the people of God, we need to deal with. We need to deal with the fact that, that worry is not something that pleases God. It speaks to God that our faith is not great enough. That our faith in Him is not great enough to see us through the problem. Ultimately, understand, a majority of our problems come from storms. It comes from spiritual warfare. And, and, and I realize that it rains on the just and the unjust. Amen. There's times that, that, that I heard a great message by Brother Waldrop talking about Job. It talked about that God threw out Job's name before the enemy. At the end, Job was blessed. But because God was proud of Job, because God was proud of, of the man Job was, that he was perfect and upright in his generations, that, that because of that, that God put his name before the enemy. Have you considered my servant Job? And Job went through all of these things. But at the end, that storm turned out to be a blessing. He was doubly blessed. More children. Probably better children. I don't know. But the concept is that that storm became the vehicle of his blessing. Man, I'm going to move on. So, the thing about prayer is that when we're praying about these things, we're supposed to pray and then put it in the hands of God. We're supposed to pray and, 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 and pray the prayer of faith. Speak those things that are not as though they were. God, I'm believing that you're going to take care of my electric bill. God, you've been faithful to me. I'm believing it. 
I'm believing you're going to take care of me. You're going to take care of my needs. And you may, again, it's not a bad thing to pray over things more than one time. I'm not saying that it is. But when you fixate on the problem, and, and it's always you're always coming to the problem of how big it is, and you're always coming to the problem of how scary it is, and, and you're always coming to the problem with an aspect of fear or, or an aspect of, of tension in you that what am I going to do, that kind of nail-biting situation. Whenever you come to it at that situation, it is, it is counterproductive. It is counteracting faith that you may otherwise be exhorting or, or putting into the situation. Amen. So we are supposed to pray about the storm. We're supposed to pray about the storm with our eyes upon Jesus. Amen. When Peter felt the buffeting of the wind, at that point, what he should have done is kept his eyes on Jesus and said, God, help me. I, I need to make it to you. This is, this is kind of scary. But with his eyes on, with his eyes on Jesus, he, he would have been able to see that Jesus is not suffering any ill effects. It's not hurting him. It's not going to hurt me. Because in, that, in seeing the, how big he is and how he's able to deal with it, you're not worried about it because you're in his hands. But whenever you look at the problem and you're not, and you're not looking at Jesus, you're not seeing how big he is. You're seeing how big the problem is. And all that does is that it reflects upon you. It reflects upon your inadequacy. It reflects upon your inability to deal with the situation. Because let's face it, when you stepped out by faith and you're out in the middle of the water and the storm comes up, you don't have the power to save yourself. Thus, Peter said, save me. The Bible does say immediately he was there. He's there to catch us. But the reason he got the rebuke was not because he stepped out of the boat. He was the only one to step out of the boat. The reason he got the rebuke was because he began to look at the storm and look at himself. If he would have looked at Jesus, he would have walked to Jesus and they both would have walked to the boat. But it didn't happen that way because he allowed himself to worry about the storm. And it destroyed his faith. There's more to it, but we'll come to that in a moment. So worry is a bad habit. It's something that we need to overcome as the people of God. We need to overcome worry. We need to overcome the, the constantly thinking of the future and how is it going to happen and how are we going to deal with it? How is this going to come to place? Oh God, we need a miracle and, and, and we're, ter we're tying ourselves into knots because of it. What it does is it speaks to God a lack of faith. It speaks to God that we don't trust Him. It speaks to God that, that we don't believe in Him. And it blinds us to what God has done for us. So when we look at the problem, it's hard to see our blessings. When we look at the problem, it's hard to see the miracles that God's already done for us. It's hard to see how powerful God is when the only thing that you can see, when the only thing you're looking at, is the problem that you're facing. Hey Amen. I think I've hit that horse enough. Let's move on. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 32 says this. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. He just gets done talking about raiment, food, so on and so forth. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So it goes and it says at the very beginning, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then it goes on to say his righteousness. So the concept here is that your focus makes a difference. You are supposed to seek first the things of God, the kingdom of God things that pertain to God and to his work, to his mission, to the church, to outreach, to Bible study, to prayer, to witnessing. All of these things, these are, should be the focus. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his holiness, to make yourself ready as the bride of Christ, to be ready when he calls the church away, that you're found without spot, without wrinkle, that those are the things you are supposed to put your attention to. Those are the things you're supposed to focus on and fixate upon not upon the struggle or the battle you're going through. Not upon the storm that, that you may or may not be in and or that may be ahead of you. You're not supposed to fixate upon those things, but rather that you're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. Before anything else. 
Now, there's a lot of a lot of situations we run up into worry and we run up into dealing with things because it is a result that we are not seeking God first. We're seeking ourselves to please ourselves to do what we want to do. It, it, it becomes it becomes uh, a pursuit of one's own pleasure rather than the mission that we have as children of God. And it, gets, and it goes on to say, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you seek God first, then you don't have to worry about these things. God is going to provide them for you. They are a byproduct of being a child of God. They're a byproduct. No matter what is going on, no matter what you're facing, these things are the, the, the things that you have need of, the victory. God already knows what you need. God already knows what you're going through. And God has promised that, that if you will seek me, then I will give you the things I need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. So that means that, that when you are seeking and pursuing the things of God, that God is going to turn those things into stepping stones. Turn them into blessings. Turn them into the things that you need. Amen. All things work together for the good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. So what this means is that it's not going to start out good. God doesn't promise that, that everything begins good. That storm may look bad. You may be in the midst of the storm and you're going through the struggle and the lightning is flashing and the wind is blowing and, and the rain is falling and it does not seem good at the moment. But when the storm has passed and the rain has fallen, it produces fruit. Amen. It, it may not understand that, that whenever that stumbling block is thrown before you, that, that when you fixate upon that and, and when it's there, it doesn't look good and, and, and you're, you're huddling in place. What do I do? How can I, how can I face this? But when you realize that this is the instrument, this is the vehicle God is bringing to my blessing, you realize that this stepping, this, this stumbling block is what God is turning into a stepping stone. He's building a stairway to take me to places I've never been before. He's taking me to anointing I've never experienced. He's taking me to a revival that I've never seen. He's bringing our church. He's bringing my family in. And all of these things are coming as a result of this stumbling block. God's taking the situation, the attacks of the enemy, the situations that I'm going through, and he's bringing them into position so that God can use them, so that God can take them and make them the instrument or the vehicle of bringing to me what I need, my blessing, my strength, my breakthrough. This is the promise of God. That when you seek him first, the things that we have need of will be added unto us. That if we hold on to him, it'll work it out for our good. That in the end result, we will have what we need. So worry is an irrational fear. If we did not serve God, would it be rational? Sure. But God has given us promises, and we're supposed to take his word by faith. Our faith is supposed to be in him and in his word. So if he says he's going to turn it out for our good, we should believe him and be able to say, all right, I'm going to do this and, and, and I'm, I'm going to follow this. It goes on to say that we're not supposed to take thought for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. That, that when we deal with tomorrow, we'll deal with it when it comes. This is something that God will take care of tomorrow when tomorrow comes. But until then, we just deal with today. We walk by faith today and know that God's going to take care of it. And it says sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That, that if you're looking to the evil to tomorrow, we live in a very unstable society. We live in an unstable time. We don't know what's going to happen. And so people are worrying, what's going to happen with the government? What's going to happen with the coronavirus? What's going to happen with all of these things? That, and, and, and the worry and the stress of it all is eating a lot of people up. But I'm here, Halaboko Shataya, as a minister of the gospel to say that God did not give us worry. Worry is not of God, but God gave us faith. God gave us trust. God gave us the ability to believe and say, no, I'm going to take the word of God. I'm going to follow the word of God, that he will turn out negative situations. Bad situations will be for my good. I might be in the midst of it right now and I can't see any good thing, but God will take it and he will bring good. He has his own purposes. He has his own plan. He knows what he's doing in the midst of all this. Governments rise and fall in his word. 
I don't have to worry about what's going on uh, because I'm not I'm not basing my my life upon a government. I'm not basing my life upon a society, but I'm built upon the word of God. I'm built in the kingdom of God. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness uh, and everything that I need will be added to me. The world may go crazy, but I'm stable. Uh, I'm on the foundation that will not move. Uh, hallelujah. I'm based upon the rock uh, of my foul salvation and it will not move. And in the end, we consider the, the, the dream that Daniel had. In the, in the end, he called out a That statue, the head of gold, and then you go down it. Oh, at, at the end, that rock, that rock, that mountain comes and crushes it, and it is established. We are to build upon a rock and a kingdom that will never fall away, that will never corrode, that will never be destroyed. Uh, the kingdom that we're building upon will not be moved. I don't know about you, but I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. So worry is not of God. We should be able to trust and believe in Him. We're all going to deal with it. We're all going to face it. But you recognize it as an enemy. You recognize it that it's something that you should not put up with. And you pray against worry. And you begin to build your faith. Build up your most holy faith. You build it up and you begin to say, no, I'm not going to worry. God, I'm trusting you for what's going on. I'm believing. You begin to speak those things that are not as though they were. Abraham believed God. He did not consider the barrenness of Sarah's womb. But he knew that whatever God said, God was able to provide. He did not take God slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness. Amen. I'm going to move on. Psalms chapter 31 verse 14. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. My times are in your hand. Amen. We are supposed to put every aspect of our life into the hands of God. My life, my times are in his hand. That means my past, whatever's chasing me, whatever might be in my past, whatever, and it's under the blood. Don't get me wrong. We, we, we are not supposed to, to do that, but, but we have maybe consequences or we have things of our, last, of, of our, of our past, products that we have of our past. Things that, that are back there and, and, and we worry about, will it catch up with me? Will, 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 that ever, will I ever have to deal with that? And, and we're not supposed to worry about our past. Our times are in his hand. The past is in his hand. My present is in his hands. Whatever what I'm dealing with right now, whatever storm I'm going through right now, it's in his hand. Whatever is in my future, whatever, whatever is in my kid's future, whatever is in my, 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 my spouse's future, whatever is in my... Uh, my brother's or my sister's future, whatever may be ahead of me, is in, is in God's hand. My times are in his hand, whether it be past or present or future. Whatever it may be, it's in his hand. And so no worry in any aspect, whether it be past, whether it be present, or whether it be future, they're in his hands. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. As the people of God, if you truly seek the kingdom of God first, if you truly put, put him before everything else, and you are living a holy and righteous lifestyle to the best of your ability, then you have an expected end. You know that the promises of God are for you. You know that God is going to turn it out for your good. You know that, that in the end, we are a part of that kingdom. Heaven's going to be our home. That, that everything else, these are just incidental details. These are just parts of the story on our road to heaven. This is, and, and that God is using these to shape us and mold us into the people he wants us to be. These are opportunities for growth, to reach the potential that God has for us. And when you understand that I'm in the hands of God and I have an expected end, I don't have to worry. I shouldn't worry. Because I have an end that is sure. It's expected. God, nothing, none of this comes as a surprise to God. God knows what I'm going through. Amen. Some people say, well, if God knows, why is he allowing me to go through it? It's because it's for your betterment. It's for your good. It's for your growth. He's shaping you into somebody that is like him. He's putting you in positions and places for, for blessing. He's putting you in positions and, and, and places so that you can reach other people. It's for the kingdom of God. And when your vision is not on the kingdom of God, and you say, well, God, I don't want to go through this, and you don't realize that God is using this to set up as a set up for something better, then 
you become despondent, you become discouraged, you become depressed. Because kingdom mindedness is a place where you understand, God, you've got a plan and I want to be in the middle of it. God, I want to have I want to have my shield of faith. I want to have my sword of the spirit. I want to be active. I want to be working. If I'm in a battle, that means I that then the victory is going to bring in some fruit. So God, help me to fight to the best of my ability. Help me to get through this as quick as I can because I want to see the victory. I want to see people saved. I want to see my family saved. I want to see the blessings of God. I want to see the work of God accomplished in the things I've been praying over. When you have a kingdom mindedness, that expected end drives you forward. You know, I can't lose. He's paid the price. I've read the back of the book. I win. And so I, I don't have to worry about failure. The only way failure is a, is a possibility is if quitting is an option. The only way that failure is possible is if you quit. That's it. There's an aspect of this as well that we live in a society that we do and it's so fast-paced and chaotic and there's so much pressure upon people and it's always, I got to do this and I got to do that and I'm, I'm busy. And, and that environment produces the stress. It produces that tightness inside of you. And that tightness, and, and with all of that, it, 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 it is a stress and worry are brother and sister. They're related. Worry produces stress, and stress can produce worry. They're related. And so within this, we see that, that because of the, the chaos of the society that we have created as American people, that it's all up on rush. I mean, but we... We still have 24-hour days like they did back in the day. But yet we find ourselves with less time than they had in a lot of ways. Because people are so wrapped up in the busyness, and, and, and I'll get to that in a moment, but they're so wrapped up in, in the drive and the fast-pacedness of our, of our life. Simplicity, or to have a simple mindset, or simple purposing of life. There's a lot to be said for simplicity. And so, as the people of God, we should have a simplicity to our life. I'm not saying we don't have stuff to do. I'm not saying that we, we're not busy people, or live as busy people, and it's not always a bad thing. But there's supposed to be a simplicity to the people of God. That we are not wrapped up in all of these aspects of our world, but that our center and our focus is on the things of God. And we live in a simplicity that is in God. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. There's supposed to be a simplicity. Amen. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in, in so many different things. We get wrapped up in, I got to do this and I got to do that. And, and we have this program and we have that program. And, and I got work here and, and I got to juggle this and I got to juggle that. And we are so engulfed by the magnitude of the tasks that we have. And that's where worry comes in. You know, simplicity helps defeat worry. It's one task, one thing at a time. As the people of God, we're supposed to do everything as we do unto the Lord. We're supposed to, to do our best in what we do. Which when you end up with people that are fast-paced and they got all these tasks, they do tasks half-heartedly. They give a half-hearted effort because they're thinking about what i got to do next. They're thinking about all the things that are ahead, all of the things that I've got to do and, and got to get this done, and got to get that done, and so their prayer is half-hearted. Their Bible reading is half-hearted. They're, they're, you fill in the blank. And it's not just things you do for God. You're supposed to do your best in everything that you do. When you're doing, your, when you're doing a job, you're supposed to do your best. When you're working on the car, you're supposed to do your best. 
when you're washing the dishes, you're supposed to do your best. Whatever you do, you're supposed to put your heart into it because you are a, a mirror of who Christ is, and he is a perfectionist. In essence, you are supposed to do what you do as a reflection of who you belong to. Amen. And God is meticulous. He, he, when he works on something, he works to make it its best. He works to see its potential fulfilled. Amen. Judges chapter 7, verse number 13. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came into a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay long. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. And I jump to verse 17 there. Verse number 18. I will blow with a trumpet, and all that are with me, then they ye shall blow trumpets also. On every side of the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. When God chooses things, God chooses the simple. God chooses the calm. God chooses the, put it this way, God chooses the simplistic to fulfill his will. In the beginning, the, the, these Men having dreams. What did God use to scare them in a dream? It wasn't a beast. It wasn't anything complicated. It was a barley roll. It was a piece of bread that rolled into the camp. But yet they were terrified. God used the simple. The other end, then he comes to the battle plan. In the battle plan, he uses... Pitchers with torches inside and trumpets and 300 men versus thousands. God chose the simple. The thing was is that they could, I mean, Gideon was, was, was struggling. And God sent him there to hear the dream. And then he was like, God's with us. What do we have to fear? If God be for us, who can be against us? So the idea is that, that God oftentimes will put us in situations where it is the simple. It's just walking around Jericho. It's, it's something that, that seems so very simplistic. And God, how in the world is this going to work? God, how are we going to, I mean, walking around these walls, how is this? But God chooses simplistic because God is putting us in places where we have to rely upon him by faith. It builds our faith. He is the one that fights for us. He's our warrior. He's the one that goes before us and, and discomforts our enemies. He's what turns our enemies against themselves and brings us victory. In the end, it was not the hand of it was not the hand of the people. It was not the arm of flesh that brought the victory, but it was that of God. It's the same for us. Amen. So we are supposed to understand that there is a simplicity to the things of God. That we're just to walk and believe God and trust God. And not to worry about all of these things and not to put ourselves in a place where we are obsessing or fixating upon things that we have no control over. Or even things that we think we have control over. <laughs> but rather we're supposed to trust God. I'm getting close to being finished. There's another area to this that I want to address and that is of escapism. The world deals with worry and with stress by escapism. If you don't know what that word means, give me a minute and I'll explain. But it is the answer of our society to deal with worry and with stress by escaping it. How they do that is they go and they play video games. Video games are a huge area of escapism because what they can do is they can escape their present reality what they're dealing with, what they're worried about, the stresses, the pressures, the emotional and mental attack that is constantly bombarded on people in our society. They can escape it by going into a, another reality on that video game. They can jump into the life of that hero who conquers every obstacle, who deals with every foe, that, that never has anything uh, really damaging to happen to them in the sense that they always overcome every obstacle and that there's nothing that they cannot do. And so 
They can jump into this reality and escape the reality that they're in. And then you have the movie and the television industry. People can, can sit down and they can jump into the soap opera where there's no realism. That you have all of these college students that never have to worry about money. They're always out going and having fun and, and there's no ramen noodles to show up anywhere. The idea is that they can escape their present reality into another reality. You have social media. They can escape their reality and, 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 and lose themselves in the posts of other people and in all of the things that social media offers. Escapism goes into drugs, alcohol, pornography. All of these are areas that in our world sells escapism as the answer to stress and worry. The problem with escapism, as the world produces it, is that it always makes the problem worse. So what happens is once you come off that video game, your problems are still there, and oftentimes the time that you spent in the video game has made the problem worse. Now that bill is even closer. Now the, uh, the conversation you've been avoiding, avoiding has gotten worse. A lot of times it is just exacerbating the problem. And so they find themselves in an even worse problem. During coronavirus, we have seen very physical, excuse me, literal examples of the effects of escapism. There was a young man that was playing video games. He got upset and threw his controller and broke it. And he had a, his father said, well, you broke it, you're going to have to wait a while before you get a new one. So, so his birthday, a couple of weeks later, whatever it was, he got a new one and was playing his video game and he got upset and broke that controller. They found him the next day and he committed suicide. The problem was is that the first time he messed it up and he was away from that escapism. And then he comes and the second time and he did it, he could not bear the thought of having to face his reality without his means of escape. And so he escaped his current reality by suicide or an even worse reality. That's escapism. That's what it does. And, it's, and the sad thing is, is that people in the church, believers, are resorting to a lot of the same things. The people of God are resorting to the same kind of escapism as our world is, to deal with their worry and to deal with their stress. But as the people of God, we are not supposed to deal with our worry and stress the way the world does. Our escapism should not come from video games. Our escapism should not come from these things. But instead, we should go to a prayer room and get a hold of the Holy Ghost. Our escapism should come from Jesus. We should escape unto our fortress, our refuge. We should escape to the one that, that can take care of the problem. Because when we come out of the prayer room, when we get out, when we, we, we come out from, in essence, that kind of escapism, our problem isn't worse, it's better. Because he's moved on it. He's worked on it. He's heard and answered our prayers. And so as the people of God, if you can hear this preacher right now, you need not to go to those things. You need to stop going. And, and, and going to escapism that our world re relies upon to deal with their worry and stress and start going to Jesus. And start getting a hold of the Holy Ghost. Uh, start getting a hold of some joy and dealing with the problem and start using some faith and saying, God, I'm trusting you that you're going to take care of the situation. And God, I'm coming right now. I need, I need you to help me. And God will prepare you a, a table in the presence of your enemies and I'll anoint your head with oil and I'll lead you to pastures that are green and ready and ripe for eating. And I'll take you beside the still waters the places of safety that's the kind of god that we serve those are the places of escapism that we can go to as the people of god we should not resort or to escape to the things that our world does they're empty wells that leave you empty and as the people of god you're laying and setting an example to people who really need something that when they look at you they say they don't got anything different because they're going to the same places that i'm going to and they're coming out just as empty as i'm coming 
coming out. But as the people of God, we're supposed to rely upon the one who saved us, redeemed us. He's the rock of our salvation. He's the sustainer of our souls. He's the giver of joy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The last thing I want to go over and then I'm done is this. There is a difference when you're praying between franticism and desperation. And I'm going to explain what that means. There's a, a distinct difference between a frantic prayer and a desperate prayer. There's, a, there's a, a line drawn between them. Oftentimes we can we can get the two confused. And our prayers can be hindered when we do not understand the difference between franticism and desperation. First Samuel chapter 13, verse number 5 says this, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore for multitude. And they came up and pitched in Mechmash, eastward from beth -Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, where the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and rocks and in high places, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal. And all the people followed him, trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, and he, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, that the Philistines gathered themselves together in Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines come down now upon me to Gilgal. I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. So the concept here is that Saul, whenever he sees the abundant enemies, the storm, if you will, when he sees the battle raging and coming against him, and he's looking, where's God? Where's my miracle? Where, where's God taking care of this situation? Where, where, where is it? I, God, I need you. Why, why hasn't the man of God come? Why hasn't Samuel come? He's, he, he's got he's to talk to God for me. We've got we to get a hold of God. We, we, we need God right now. There was born inside of Saul franticism, a frantic effort try to gain the merit and favor of God. So what happens is that God, there's a lot that goes into this. First of all, Saul was not supposed to offer the sacrifice. But second, Samuel told him to wait. The word of the Lord was there. Wait upon me. Wait upon the Lord. And so he's here and seven days have come and, and I don't have my victory yet. I don't, I don't have the word of the I don't have the word of the Lord yet. I, I don't have what I need. And so out of a frantic effort, he quickly says, bring me, bring me stones. And they, and they build the altar and, and, they, and they put the, the bullock on there and, they, and he offers the sacrifice. And Samuel comes and says, you've done foolishly. He was out of an attitude and out of a heart of frantic pursuit The thing about it is, is that God does not honor franticism because franticism comes out of a lack of faith. 
We're going to back up to the story with, with Peter on the water. He's walking on the water and he sees the storm. And when he sees the storm, he becomes afraid. And, and, he, and he looks at his own inadequacies. And he sees the storm and he, and he sees the water and he says, I can't do this. I can't walk on water. And I'm in a storm. I can't deal with this. This I, I can't swim in this kind of water. This water's too much for me. And, 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 and all of a sudden, what Francisism does is it begins to look at me. It begins to look at the arm of flesh and say, I can't do this. And so it is a frantic, oh God, save me! And then Jesus looks at him and says, oh ye of little faith. The reason why Jesus said that is because of franticism. It was a frantic pursuit of God that came out of a lack of faith and a looking at one's own strength. Because let's face it, we're inadequate. When we're facing the things that we do as people of God, when we are facing the battles that we face and, and the spiritual wickedness in high places and when you're dealing with devils and, and, and strongholds, and the rulers of darkness of this world, when you're dealing with things like this, let's face it, on our own we're inadequate. We can't deal with these things on our own. But when you begin to look at the problem and you begin to feel that spiritual warfare and you begin to feel that struggle and, and the car breaks down and all these things happen and all of a sudden you become overwhelmed and you allow that worry to rush in and you begin to frantically search after God. Oh God, I can't deal with this. And God looks at that and sees somebody that he has been with the whole time. The person that he's been causing to walk on the water. The person he called out of the boat. And he sees them begin to sink. And frantically say, Lord, save me. We know his character. We know the character of God. And he comes and he grabs his hand and he pulls him up and they walk together in the boat. But I can see and in my mind's eye, the shaking of his head, the disappointment on his face. Because what changed? In that situation, what changed? God was the same. His power was the same. Peter was still walking on the water. Nothing changed except Peter's faith. So as the people of God, we're not supposed to come to God with franticism. And God's dealt with me on this because I've, I've been there. I've done that. I've been struggling. Oh, God, I, I'm struggling with this. God, I, I, and I, I came to God with a, with a place and God smote me, convicted me. And one of the motivations for this message was that God spoke to me and said, I am not pleased with a frantic prayer. Now, with that said, we need to make the distinction because there's a difference between a frantic prayer and a desperate prayer. Because frantic, a frantic prayer focuses on the problem and focuses on our inadequacies. But a desperate prayer realizes our inadequacies, but focuses on his ability to save us and get us through. A desperate prayer focuses, uh, focuses on the power of God and that he is taking us through this and that he has all power. A desperate prayer acknowledges our inadequacies. It doesn't focus on our inadequacies. I hope this is making sense to you and you're getting this because it's important. A frantic prayer looks at the problem and makes the problem so big and it looks at us and sees how, how small we are compared to our trial and our, and our battle and we quake in fear and we huddle in fear and we begin to sink and we begin to drown in our situation. But a desperate prayer is one that when you're walking on the water and you feel the buffeting of the waves and you see Jesus and you're like, God, remember our flesh. Remember that I'm but flesh and blood, God, and I can't deal with these things on my own. I need you. And a lot of times that's rebuilding our own faith because he already knows it. 
But God, I believe in you. God, I know that I can see you. You're right there on the water in front of me. I'm, I'm trusting in you. I'm believing on you. I'm taking this one step at a time. I, I might be, I might be in a place where that I, I'm a little concerned. I, I may be uneasy about the, the battle I'm in, God. And, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm desperate for you right now, God. I'm desperate for you to walk with me. I need your assurance. I need you to, I need you to come and to touch me and bring joy and peace to my mind. That's desperation. You realize you are in adequacy, but you're focusing on his ability to fill you. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. You're recognizing your, 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 your problems. You're recognizing your inadequacy, but you're not focusing on them. You're focusing on his ability to fill it. That's the distinct difference between franticism and desperation. Franticism always takes it to me. It was a frantic effort on Saul's part. I've got to do something. I've got to, it, it, it's my ability to build this altar, my ability to sacrifice this that's going to gain the favor. It wasn't, it wasn't out of faith that he sacrificed. It was out of a frantic heart. Hey Amen. If you would pray with me, Lord Jesus, I pray to God. God, I pray against depression right now, God, that is setting in upon people's hearts and minds. God, I pray to God against the worry and the stress that people are dealing with, God. I pray for me to Jesus. I need strength and help to deal with what we go through to God on a daily basis. God, help us to have faith. Help us to depend upon you. Help us to have a simplicity that is in Christ. Yes, God, to be desperate for you to God, but to realize that you have the strength to take us through it, God. Help us to be people of faith, people of the name, to believe and to trust you, to take you at your word and to believe in your promises. Oh, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, give joy to your people, God. Give joy to your people, God. The joy of the Lord is our strength, dear God. Give us joy that Jesus to face what we're going through. The spiritual warfare that we face, the battles that come against the church. Mighty God, all the problems that God, the enemy tries to throw in our face to say, look, I'm winning, I'm defeating you. But God, we know, Lord Jesus, that if God be for us, then who can be against us? Us. Rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. In the name of Jesus, I pray to God. I pray anointing to fall upon the believer right now. God, I pray anointing for Haladaboshata to be upon them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, for the greatest weapon in this warfare is the anointed human spirit. The greatest weapon we have is when people begin to believe and have faith and to walk faithfully before God. The greatest weapon we have is that when the people of God are anointed and they pray with anointing and they pray with faith and they walk with faith and they rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, 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 go ahead, continue to pray, turn on some praise music, worship, and have yourself a good time on the Holy Ghost. We're going to end the broadcast, but I encourage you to keep praying, keep worshiping God as long as the Holy Ghost moves in your home and with you. And God bless you. See you tonight at 6 o'clock.